everyone. Today I am joined by my two friends, Pam Barnhill and Heather Tully. I'm so excited to have you both here today. Thanks so much for having us, Amy. Well, when Pam is not homeschooling her three kids, she can be found empowering other homeschoolers at pambarnhill.com. She is the host of the popular Your Morning Basket podcast and author of Better Together, Strengthen Your Family, Simplify Your Homeschool, and Savor the Subjects That Matter Most. Pam lives with her family in Alabama. Heather is a mom of 10 kids who has been practicing a gathering time in her home for over 18 years. As a documentary photographer, she seeks to capture the wonder in everyday life. You can find Heather online at heathertullyphotography.com, where she shares her work and photos of her family from their Georgia home. Now, both Heather and Pam have been previous guests on the podcast, but never at the same time. So I'm super excited to have you guys here today. You have a new book coming out, or I guess at this point it has come out that you worked on together. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the topic of gathering. And I'll kind of alternate back and forth. So hopefully we won't get lost as to who will answer first, but let's just start big picture. What do you even mean by the term gathering time and why and when did you initially start including a gathering time in your homeschool? Pam, you want to get us started first? Yeah, I can get us started. And um, so I haven't actually been gathering as long as Heather has. <laughs> um, she is the pro at this, but um, I've been gathering. So what I mean, wh what Heather and I both mean when we talk about a gathering time in our home is any time of day when you bring all of your children together for everyone to learn together. So you're working on, it works really best with what we call content area subjects. Um, things like science, history, nature study, um, music appreciation, things like that, as opposed to skill area subjects, which are things like math and composition and learning to read. Now, some moms, I'm going to caveat that with some moms combine kids for that because I know Heather does, but a lot of moms let those kids work individually on those subjects. But gathering is where you can all come together and learn some of those content subjects. So I started doing it when my oldest was about seven. She's 16 now. And the main reason that I started doing it was because um, it, I wanted to do all of those little things in my homeschool, things like singing uh, hymns and learning songs and um, reading poetry together and memorizing things. And I would schedule them into my homeschool days throughout the week, but they never got done. We were so busy checking off all the lists and everything that those little bits and pieces were the things that got dropped out of the schedule. And so it was only by putting them together and giving them a weight in a specific time of day that they actually started getting done. So that's how it started for us. I was very inspired by uh, Cindy Rollins, Misty Winkler, and Brandy Vinsel um, to do this kind of time in my homeschool day. How about you, Heather? You've been doing this for 18 years now. What kind of first got you started? Yeah, so we started back when she was three, and I wanted a time when I could do something with both the child and the one-year-old. And so I wanted to combine both of them together. And I wanted to make sure, kind of like what Pam was saying, I wanted to make sure those things that were a priority were getting done. So it started with just reading the Bible, doing some catechism, and then doing poetry. And it was really short and sweet. And then through the years, it's grown and it's gotten longer with more children. Um, but it started really short and sweet. And then we started adding in more things. And for us, it's a time, you know, there's those skill things you're learning and those contents you're learning together, but it's also a time of community. It's a time when all of us can be together. Um, and it varies. Like Pam said, it can be any time of the day. There's been times when it's right after breakfast. And then there was a season with a very busy baby that we did it after dinner um, so that daddy could help with the baby. So it's varied in, in times, but we're all together building that sense of a family community and then also a community of ideas because we're not just studying one thing. It's all these various topics and little bits each day. And it builds this sense of learning and building relationships across the board. So um, I loved it. It's become our favorite part of the day. It's, it's just, it's the thing that always gets done <laughs> out of all, you know, that and math. We try to always get math. 
Um, I think I, I can I just add on like one of the things that Heather said made me think like I get such a feeling of accomplishment after having completed we call it morning time in our house and we typically we don't do it early in the morning but we typically do it first thing before we do other things and so by the time we finished morning time um and like we've done literature we've done geography we've done memorization uh we've done a little religious ed studies you know there's so many things that we've gotten done i'm like I'm like rocking and rolling today. So it it really does. It's, it's that kind of shot in the arm feeling of accomplishment that it's so hard being a homeschool mom some days. And so it's nice to like, man, we got that done. And so that's one of my favorite things about it. I really relate to what you both are saying. So my oldest is 16, like yours, Pam. And we started our morning time routine when he was probably seven or eight. And just to be, have, finally have this way where I could take the things that had been my priorities, those priorities hadn't changed. I could just never figure out a way to actually get them into the reality of my daily life. And so to just prioritize that time when we would come together. And now as I have much older children, you know, still the wide age range, and we're all often going in different directions to know we at least have that time every day where we're going to have that connection together, those shared memories, the inside jokes that develop over Shakespeare or whatever. It's so important. And I, I treasure it so much, especially as I, I see those older kids getting ready to head out, you know, head out on their own. So, well, Heather, I would love to ask you as someone who's done this now for many years, have you noticed your approach or your sort of perspective on gathering time changing or developing over the years? Yeah. For sure. Um, so in the beginning, I think I saw our morning time, or at that time we were calling it circle time, and you can't really call it that with big kids. <laughs> at least my kids did not like that name. So um, it was more of a focus of memory work. And so we would gather together, and it was a lot of reciting and chanting. And that had its place, and we still do a lot of memory work as a family. But through the years, we've added in more hymns, we sing folk songs, um, we diagram sentences together at the table. I get a little lap board and um, whiteboard, a little small one, and I hold it up, and we diagram sentences. Um, we'll do map work at the table, all of us together, so that I don't then later have to do map work with several children throughout the day. Um, and we do a ton of read alouds now. And before, maybe we were just reading the scriptures. And I went and I counted before we got together. And we have 14 books going right now. And a morning basket. So we don't read all 14 in one sitting. I pick a few each day. And it's various topics. There's Shakespeare. There's poetry. There's history books. There's a few science books. Um, so I pick a few, we read it and we discuss it and then we just kind of loop around and sometimes we get through it quicker, quicker than other years. Um, so a lot more reading aloud, a lot more singing. It feels more alive than it used to when we were just, when they were just having to perform and chant back to me. They're now engaging in conversation and they take turns reading. Um, and so it also has meant our time has grown. And so that didn't happen overnight. We slowly added the time, but we're gathering now for about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, where before we started with 10 minutes. Um, that's all a three-year-old could do at that time. Um, and so it was short and sweet. And then just through the years, just a little bit more. And, and now I have to stop myself because those big kids do have to do their homework. <laughs> So I have to I have to make sure I honor their time by not going too long um, because they're there with us. Yeah. You know, I had Cindy Rollins on the podcast last year and I asked her, what is the most important thing you think everyone should include in their morning time? And she said, singing. And I was so taken aback and I don't know, I hadn't really prioritized that in our morning time, but I thought, well, if Cindy Rollins says I got to do it, I better do it. And ever since then we have, we've included that not just in our family devotions in the evening, but I've begun including that in our morning time. And that's been a real delight. I, I can, that word you used, it's, it's a more alive, you know, it's more living when we sing together. How about you, Pam? How have things kind of grown and changed over the years? Um, mine is kind of like ebbed and flowed a little bit. Um, so, you know, I think we always started out. So my kids have always been real keen on the idea of we get to sit and do what we want to do while we do morning time. 
And so for the longest time, I mean, they would get so involved in their projects. They were so happy to sit there because to them, they felt like they were getting away with something. They weren't having to do school yet because we were doing morning time. So you can use this to your advantage. <laughs> <laughs> little do they know. And so they would be sitting there doing things with their hands. They We did rainbow loom, perler beads, lots and lots of watercolors, drawing puzzles, um, pattern blocks, just so many things that they did and made. And so ours is always you know, once we got started with it, ours has always been about at least an hour long. Then when my daughter started doing middle school, my oldest started doing middle school, uh, we were involved with the co-op at the time and she had a lot of other things she needed to do. So I backed off and made it, you know, much shorter, only about 20 minutes long. And then I didn't like that as much, you know, it didn't feel as good or as life-giving. So eventually we dropped the co-op and made our morning time longer again. <laughs> so, and that's what feels better to us. So right now it's probably about an hour long. Maybe some days we go a little bit longer if we get into really good conversations. So it's just kind of ebbed and flowed through the years. And I like hearing from both of you that it's not like you were married to a certain plan. Like, well, this is the way we started. It always has to look just this way in order for it to be a success. But it because it can really ebb and flow with the ages of your children or the season of life, it's very flexible and you can make it work for your unique family. Very much so. Well, this all sounds lovely, but um, speaking for myself, I know sometimes the gathering is not quite as peaceful as we wish it would be. What are some of the challenges that you have faced uh, in your family's gathering time, Pam, and how have you sought to overcome those challenges? Well, sometimes photographers show up and my kids decide they're going to have really bad attitudes about the whole experience, despite the fact that they had given permission for the photographer to be there. Um, so, yeah, I think the biggest thing we deal with right now are teenage attitudes, you know, just that kind of surliness. I didn't sleep well. I stayed up too late. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to do this all the time. And, you know, usually it's just a matter of, waiting it out because I could start butting heads with them and they're just going to get more and more surly. Um, you know, you really can't force them. And so you kind of have to wait it out and talk to them and have conversations to their heart about why this is important. And, you know, eventually they come around again and it goes well, but that's, that's kind of the biggest thing right now that we're struggling with. I know a lot of families with younger children struggle with things like, you know, toddlers who are disrupting the day. And so maybe for a season, you have to do it like Heather did it, where you're, you're doing it at a different time of day. So you could get help with the toddler, or maybe you make it really short for a season. There are just so many different things that come up. And, uh, I think the biggest thing is to know that you're not alone. Whatever problem you're facing in morning time or your gathering time, there's probably been somebody who's experienced it and had to deal with it. How about you, Heather? What have been some challenges that you guys have faced in gathering time? Well, Pam's not alone. Um, attitudes are, are hard and it's not always the kids. Like sometimes I don't want to do morning time. I I get distracted. I'm tired. I stayed up too late and now I have to start our day and that's hard. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's mama needing to stop and pray and go, okay, this is a priority for our family. And we usually, at this point, we do it first thing. And so to start our day, we need to start here. This is this is putting what is good first before the rest of the day gets busy. And so sometimes I have to stop and pray about my attitude. And it's usually, you know, we have a big family. So usually at least one is grumpy at morning time. Like it's just going to happen. <laughs> and I just keep on going. Singing helps even if you don't sing well. Um, there's something about folk songs and it just tends to bring around better attitudes or letting that child who's struggling pick what we're going to do that day. So just throw out what I had planned and say, what do you want to do today? Sometimes they don't want to answer and we just move on. Um, but sometimes well, I wanted to read this book or I really want to do geography, you know, and can we pull out the sand and do geography? And it's like, okay, I can do that for that child. Um, so yeah, attitudes. And then I was going to say interruptions because, um, you know, I try really hard to not let schedules interrupt when we do our gathering time, but life happens. And we have big kids who now work outside the home. 
And so um, if a big kid is missing, I'll do our normal gathering time and I jot down what we read aloud and they catch up later on their own. They don't wanna miss out on those read alouds and they're able to do that. Um, if it's an appoint appointment and we need to move our gathering time, I try to give the kids a heads up. Um, I've got several that if I don't let them know our schedule for the day, they struggle. And so if I can give them a heads up, that helps them know, hey, we're going to gather today after lunch instead of in the morning. Um, so that helps. And then learning just to persevere with littles. Um, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of mess when you've got toddlers and babies. And um, often when they were tiny, a big kid was walking circles with a baby or I was walking circles and I'm holding a book and reading aloud with a baby on it. And um, just learning to embrace a little bit more of the chaos is really important if you've got a lot of people and with various ages. If we set ourselves up with these expectations of this rosy filtered, you know, quiet <laughs> picture in our heads, then we're going to spend the whole time just frustrated, right? By the attitude or by the noise or by the mess. And sometimes it just helps us to remember going into things like it will be messy, People are going to be grumpy. Things might not go according to plan. And that's okay. And just having our expectations set appropriately can sometimes help us actually accomplish our goals more joyfully, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I think the important thing, Amy, is it's beautiful and worthy despite the mess and the noise. Like, yeah. you're going to sometimes just feel despair. You're going to feel like, I'm just not... Like, there's no way they're learning about these artists. There's no way they're enjoying this music. There's no way that there's getting, they're getting this read aloud, you know, because it's just like, I'm constantly having to stop and correct somebody or somebody has a horrible attitude or, you know, we only got to it three days this week. You know what? Just over the years, it all builds up and it's beautiful and worthy despite kind of the messiness of it sometimes. And I think you're right. We can't have that unrealistic expectation in our head because then we just stop trying. Yes. And I love that. I want to move into some of those blessings of the gathering time. Why is this worth it? Why is it worth pursuing? Heather, in your family, has there been anything that surprised you as a blessing from gathering time or just something that you've really noticed in your family? Yeah. So a few things. Um, we've had those shared stories that have become kind of a part of the culture. Like, the shared stories of Narnia. And we're going through it a second time in our family reading it aloud. And it's been so much fun because the littlest ones don't know the whole story. They know bits and pieces, but we're reading it for the first time. But the big kids jump in with their favorite memories of, I remember we read this at this place or we did this. And so that's been fun to hear their memories. Um, and it builds, I think it helps build their relationship because they're learning and they're enjoying something together. And that's, that's really good for their relationship building as siblings. Um, I've seen their attention grow. So when you read a book over several weeks, or sometimes we're reading a book for a whole year, you have to really pay attention to follow that story. And so it helps them to recall things and to remember. Um, they learn to pay attention when there's noise with those busy toddlers. Um, they learn to forgive and be patient with each other. Um, they learn to disagree with one another kind of. <laughs> because, you know, when we're discussing current events and we're talking about something in politics, they might have different opinions. And so they're learning to express them in a way that is kind, but well thought out. Um, and one of the things that really surprised me through the years is we've come to love Shakespeare. And I never saw that coming. Um, I just, I remember the first time we listened to Shakespeare being read aloud, it was an audiobook. I was so confused. And they were confused. And I thought, okay, we're just going to keep going. Like, we're just going to keep listening. And now we, we understand it and we read it regularly. And that has just been such a delight. Um, and I have a daughter who is considering doing that for graduate school. And I thought, huh, who knew? Like, if we hadn't opened up that book and tried it and kept on going, we would have gotten there. And so that's been a fun surprise. Um, so, yeah. I love that too, because it wasn't like an immediate thing that you loved right away. 
that's such a good encouragement. Sometimes I think we're too quick to toss the book or toss the curriculum because like, oh yeah, we just aren't quite into it. We've tried it like once or twice, but just that willingness to know something's worth pursuing and to keep at it, your affections grew and your ability to understand grew over time. So that's really cool. And I'm a big Shakespeare fan, so I'm especially <laughs> excited about that one. <laughs> How about you, Pam? Has anything really surprised you or been a blessing to your family from your gathering time? Just the relationships we have with each other. Just, you know, uh, I could see us going off to our own little corners of the house with different, you know, our own little different books if we weren't gathering together each day. And it could almost feel just as lonely. Like, you know, if, if the kids went to public school, like we would just be passing each other and not really engaging with each other in any meaningful way in the day. And that's what, you know, that's what it is for us. That's what morning time is, is the place where we engage each other in meaningful ways. And then, you know, I'm kind of the opposite of Heather because, you know, here she is a mom of 10 and they're all spread out. Whereas, you know, we're, I'm a mom of three and they're 12 to 16. And so there could have been no more efficient use of our time in our homeschool than to have all three of those kids right there together. And so if you do have a family where the kids are closer in age together, I can't recommend it enough because uh, you just, you can just really uh, do the things that you need to do with everyone. And I think it makes it more enjoyable because you're all there together, but it's definitely really efficient as well. Yeah. Okay. So a mom is listening to this conversation or she's just picked up your new book and she's feeling all inspired. And she's like, great, tomorrow we're going to go. We're going to have this three hour gathering time. I'm going to put all the amazing things in it, right? We can listen to a podcast or read something and get so excited. And then we end up burning out. Maybe that's just me, but what would you kind of encourage to that mom who wants to get started in this way? What would be the first steps to start incorporating a gathering time? What would you say, Pam? Well, the first thing to do is to stay off of Pinterest. Like, don't go there. <laughs> that, that's bad. And then the second thing to do would be just to start very small. So there's probably a very good chance that you're already doing either some kind of prayer, devotional, or scripture reading, right? And so do that and then add one thing. So figure out one thing that you think your children would enjoy. And if you have, I call them the tough nuts to crack. If you have the boy who's between like the ages of nine and 14, and you know that they're going to be the one who's like, what do you mean? You know, find something that they like, find something that they enjoy and have that be the first thing you add. Do it for three or four days, just like that. And then add something else and do it for another week, just like that. And then add something else. And I always encourage moms to put in one thing for each of your children and then put in the thing that you're really passionate about. So if you're like, oh, we're going to learn like all 16 verses of this ancient hymn, save that for last, right? Like get everybody else started on the things that they really enjoy before you start learning verse one of 16. Um, and so then you're going to have buy-in from them and it's just going to, it's going to grow and uh, lengthen over time. And so uh, it's kind of like the old adage about boiling a frog. If you throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, they're going to hop right out. But if you put them in cold water and turn up the heat slowly, they're not going to know what hit them. And that's, that's how we do morning time. Yeah. When you start small and you're actually successful, it sets you up to think, oh, I can do this. And then you're more inclined to keep going. Yeah. Would you add anything, Heather? Well, that was great. Um, I would encourage mamas to keep going, even if it's hard at first. You know, you're building habits of attention. You're teaching them to love things that are hard to understand sometimes. Shakespeare or poetry or, or even let's read and discuss the scriptures. That can be really hard sometimes, and but it's good and it's worthy of the work. And so um, I think I say it in the book that some days of gathering is amazing. You're like, this was picture worthy. I should have done photos. There's a lot of days that are really hard, but most of the days are just ordinary and yeah. you don't see a lot of fruit. And you do wonder, I think Pam said it earlier, you wonder like, do they get it? But you'll start to see it if you pay attention. You'll see it in conversations later. Um, you'll see it in their affections changing, those things really want to read before maybe they enjoy it now 
um, or they understand it better. So keep going. I think you have to have a little bit of faith that you're going to look ahead and, and move forward. So. Heather, I'd like to dig into that comment you made a little bit more about how many of these days are just very, very ordinary. I think that's sort of the reality for most homeschool days, right? And it can be hard for us to see the beauty right there in the midst of the ordinary. Maybe we're comparing our, you know, worst day to someone else's best day or just our ordinary day to someone else's pretty special day. And we can lose heart or just feel like it doesn't really matter. So I would love to kind of hear both the heart issue, like how can we change our heart and our perspective as we think about our own homeschool days? And then specifically as the resident photographer here today, how can we change like our literal view as we, as we look around and maybe even document what's going on? Yeah. Um, well, Pam said it earlier, stay off Pinterest, stop comparing, like maybe stay off Instagram, even though I'm there and I love it. But if you're comparing when you get on there, it's probably not a good place to be. Um, I think the hard issues is homeschooling and raising children is a walk in faith with the Lord. And his work, his work in our children and his work in ourselves takes time. And you don't often see the fruit. Or we don't see the fruit we think we should see, but it's the fruit he's doing in their lives. And so I think really our thoughts as moms and saying, Lord, you're working in them and you're good timing and I trust you. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. I'm going to repent when I'm anxious. I'm going to seek to be at peace. Um, and I'm going to wait on what you're doing. Like, that's the hard thing I have to tell myself a lot, even with big kids. Like, you have to remind yourself, this is the Lord working in them. Um, and, you know, pray a lot. I always, you know, pray more than you're talking. <laughs> it's a good motto. Um, from a photographer point of view, you need to start looking. I think before you try to take the photo, you need to see, observe what's in front of you. Um, these days that feel like they'll never end. And I remember thinking, you know, we, we were blessed but we had 19 years of pregnancy and babies. And it that wasn't a season. That's a life. And it felt very ordinary and it felt very repetitive and sometimes mundane. But I, I asked the Lord to help me change my perspective. And then I started looking. So that table that's in front of you that day with all those children isn't going to look that way next year. And so it's worthy of remembering that toddler. And it's worthy of remembering that big kid who really loved that science book and narrated. And so I want to remember those moments. So that's why I take pictures of those to help me remember and help me to pay attention. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful encouragement and reminder. How about you, Pam? Would you have any encouragement for changing pers our perspective or finding beauty in the ordinary? Well, oh, um, you know, I speak alongside Sarah McKenzie, and I've heard her say a couple times this spring already um, that most of our homeschool days are going to be ordinary, and that's okay. Like, that's completely and totally what most days are supposed to be like, right? We can't even, um, you know, if every day were just this fabulous, wonderful, awesome day, that would eventually wear you out just like the hard days do, right? And so the vast majority of our days are going to be ordinary and that's okay. And I love the fact that ordinary contains the word order because <laughs> I like to say, you know who likes order? God likes order. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's a good thing, you know? Uh, and I, I think we just need to get over the fact that not every day is going to be Instagram perfect. The ordinary days are, are okay days. And, you know, that's, that's largely what we're after. So my site, you know, is humility and doxology. And this is just making me think how much of that is really comes down to pride where we wouldn't say it this way to ourselves, but we really want to accomplish this great thing. You know, we want to perform either for people outside, but sometimes even just for ourselves. So we can pat ourselves on the back and be like, look at me being an awesome homeschool mom or impress our kids or our spouse or you know, whoever. And it's really about performing and achieving something grand and glorious ourselves instead of humbly coming and seeing um, our need for God to work in us 
and in our children and just that reality of being a finite creature, like being willing to be content in that small space where God has placed us. Um, so yeah, it's probably a good reminder to repent as so much of home education is. Well, before I move on to the questions that I'm going to ask you guys that I'm asking all my guests this season, um, do let people know where can they find the new Gather book? Pam, you they want can, to let people know? Yeah, yeah. They can find it at pambarnhill.com slash gather. Um, so we have it over there and you can order a copy there. That's the only place you can order it unless you're going to see me at a great homeschool convention this year. Um but we're keeping it exclusively on the website. So it's not going to be available on Amazon or anything. You can pick up your copy there. I cannot wait to get my copy. I have my pre-order in and it, the photos just look absolutely gorgeous. Heather, how many families did you travel to document? Well, well thank you. And there's um, nine families. So there's Pam and I's families and then seven others. And, um, and that was just, it was such a gift to get to go into these women's homes and, and to see, I think, you know, often they do struggle to see the beauty of the ordinary. And so to give them the gift of, a, of the photos, I think helped them to see it with fresh eyes. And I was so inspired. Um, it was such an encouragement to my soul and to our family, um, not just things to do, but just to see the love that these mamas are pouring out with their children. Um, it was a really beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's going to be an encouragement to many homeschool moms. So I'm really excited. Well, here at the end, I'm going to ask you the questions I'm asking everyone this season. And so the first, Pam, what are you personally reading lately? I am actually rereading, but it's been so long since I originally read it. It's like sixth grade. <laughs> That it's almost a new read. So I am rereading All Creatures Great and Small right now. Um, and we were in, I, my daughter and I have been watching the series on PBS. Love it. Totally recommend it. And I read all of uh, James Harriet's books when I was about in sixth grade. And I had forgotten so much. So it's been wonderful just revisiting that and going back through and uh, reading that again. So I've got the first two and I'm almost done with the first one. So. We read that book in my in-person book club last spring. It was a great book to read in the spring. It felt like a perfect spring read. So everyone should go to their library and grab a copy. Yeah. How about you, Heather? Do you have anything that you're reading lately? Yeah, so I'm in the midst of the Odyssey. So I'm doing that with some kids, but I have loved this year we did um, the Iliad and now we're doing the Odyssey at the end of the year. And I have just loved it because up until this point, I had only ever read like children's versions which are really good, but to read the original and we're doing it as an audio book and we read along like, so we have the physical book, but listening has helped us get through it. And um, I've just loved it. So I've really enjoyed that. And then I was gonna also share, I did need a break. I was like, okay, this is a lot. This is heavy. This is, you know, heavy stuff. Um, I just finished um, The Last Bookshop in London by Madeline Martin. It was so delightful. I read it in two days. Like it was, so it was a quick read, but it's just, if you love books, you have to go read that book. It is, it's set on um, World War II and it's a bookshop and um, it was just delightful. And it was what I needed after, there's a lot of heavy stuff in those ancient, <laughs> ancient readings. So um, if you're needing some light spring or summer reading, that, that's the book. Okay, I know what I'll be adding to my library hold list when we're done here. Uh, Heather, what was the um, audio version or what's the translator that you are listening to? And I'll put that in the show notes. I'll have to look. It's, a, is it something Wilson? Emily, Emily Wilson. Wilson. I was going to ask if that was the one. That one was so delightful. I read it last year. It been, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so good. And we're listening to Masterclass on Audible has a series of lectures. I think it's 12 lectures. And that has been so insightful for helping us to understand what we're reading. <laughs> so I'd highly recommend that. Yeah. 
Well, I'm really glad to hear that you were listening to the Emily Wilson version. I just have to take a quick little rabbit trail here. So in high school was when I was first introduced to the Iliad with the Fitzgerald translation. Oh, it gripped me. I loved it. It's been a favorite book ever since. Um, I love sharing it with my kids, but I just could not get into the Odyssey at the time. And it was a different translator. It was the Lattimore translation. So last year I was rereading the epics. I reread the Iliad and I was like, maybe I should just try a different translation of the Odyssey. And sure enough, reading it in a different translation, I was like, oh, this is actually really beautiful. <laughs> so sometimes with those, um, those older works, if you didn't like it the first time, I guess my tip would just be try a different translator because it really can make a difference a lot of times. Yeah. Tell. Okay. So final question. Heather, what would be your best tip for helping the homeschool day run smoothly? Okay. So I was really tempted to say gather. <laughs> so gather again. But I thought, all right, we just spent a long time talking about gather. So what's another tip? Though I will say go gather with your children because you're going to get a lot done. You're going to build community, um, build relationships. It, it really is such a beautiful thing. Um, but the other tip I often give mamas is you need to be home to homeschool. And, you know, I know some people thrive on activity and they're, they're more extroverted than I am. Um, but especially in those early years when they're first learning to read, when they're getting the foundation and solid math or writing, you need, they need time to be home. And that's real, you know, there's a season we've done it, you know, in the van and driving, but they need focused attention. And then they need time to just be kids to go outside and play, to bake cookies in the kitchen, to just live life and build that atmosphere of community outside book work. And so, you know, you brought them home to homeschool, but then I think it's really easy to get really busy and not be home. And then we wonder why they're tired and we're tired and they're stressed. Um, even with big kids, I have to sometimes pull back and say, you're still a part of the family. <laughs> we still need to see you. You need to be here, you know, often. So, yeah. Really good reminder. How about you, Pam? What would be your tip? Can I just fall back on my like old faithful tip of start your day with a song? <laughs> yeah. That's so, a good one. <laughs> believe it or not, your children have their own agenda. Like they wake up in the morning with something that they want to do that day. And if you're not always speedy with getting started with breakfast and school and all of those things, they kind of get into their own little work. And we like walk in and expect them to just drop that and stop and come immediately. And even if they're obedient in doing that, it's still jarring for them, you know? And so I like to say, avoid the light switch transition by starting to play a song. Just pick any song that your family enjoys, anything that's good, um, that you like, play it loud enough that everyone in your house can hear it. So instead of mom walking around the house yelling over and over again, it's time to start school and the yelling turning into angry yelling before it's over, because sometimes that happens, right? Then your kids know when they hear the song, they have until the song is over to get to the table and be ready to start, whether that be gathering time, their math, uh, lesson, their reading lesson, whatever it is you start with. And so it really, really does help, especially if you start when your kids are young and you start working with them on this. Sometimes you have to have a consequence if they break it, but you know what? I can think of maybe one or two times in the past nine years that my children have not showed up when they were supposed to. Um, so it really does work. And the attitudes are so much better than starting your day with kind of like trying to round everybody up. Yeah, what a joyful way to get the day started musically yeah. <laughs> with a smile. Pam, where can people find you all around the internet? All around the internet. Um, you can find me at pambarnhill.com. That's where the Your Morning Basket podcast, which is all about gathering time, that's where you can find that. And the 10 Minutes to a Better Homeschool podcast. And then I'm on social media as Your Morning Basket. Great. How about you, Heather? Yeah, I'm on Instagram as Heather Tully Photography. And then my um, website is heathertullyphotography.com. Perfect. And I will have links to all those things and to the new book, Gather, in the show notes for this episode over at humilityanddoxology.com. Thank you, ladies, for joining me today. It was really fun to chat. Thanks, Amy.